I want to talk uh, today about an equal opportunity savior. <clears throat> I, uh, oh, she was supposed to be here, and I don't see her. Um, prior to uh, preaching the second service on a fifth Sunday, <clears throat> there's a senior saint I always ask in the congregation, and I've said this before, and I will continue to say it. I, I asked her, I said, do you have any advice for me? Uh, and and, and uh, so I, I, I query this unnamed senior saint, and, and Marlene always responds, make it short, keep it light. Make it short. So, and it's become a joke uh, between us. And uh, so I will, I will try to keep it succinct. We're going to be looking at John 4 and verses uh, 3 to 27 this morning. And I entitled this uh, Equal Opportunity Savior. Now, in our world today, we, <clears throat> excuse me, we hear a lot about equality and equity. <clears throat> and those two things are not identical. Equality is when each individual or group of people is given the same resources and opportunities. Equality is equal opportunities. Equity recognizes that each person has different circumstances and allocates the same resources and opportunities needed to reach an equal outcome. <clears throat> Equality is equal opportunity Equity is equal outcome. In the political realm, it's called socialism. And, <clears throat> and we see it today. We see it in the fact that uh, uh, the proposal has been put forth that those with good credit and who want to get a, mor a mortgage will pay extra fees to support those who don't. That is called equal outcomes, not equal opportunity. So I, I want to look at this, and if, if you ever see uh, help wanted signs, a lot of times at the bottom of them, you'll see EOE, Equal Opportunity Employer. And today I, I want to put forth that Jesus is an equal opportunity savior. Now in the story in John 4, <clears throat> if, you, if you glance through it, and I'm not going to go the whole way through it, we'll touch many parts in it. It's a story of the familiar story of the woman at the well. And uh, basically Jesus was in the south of Israel and he intended to go to the north, up to Galilee. And uh, he chose to go through the area in between called Samaria. And the, the Samaritans were uh, looked down upon by the Jews. But what's really amazing, after he decided to go through Samaria, <clears throat> he came to a well and he sat there and a Samaritan woman came into him and he began to speak to her. And the, the uh, discussion slowly turned from things physical to things spiritual in that. And in the end, <clears throat> he made a profound uh, confession of who he was. So we'll look at this, but I am going to just tear it apart in, in, in parts. What I want to look at is that Jesus does not care who you are, your ethnicity, your race, your social class, none of that. That's all made man, man made. Jesus and God has one race. It's called, this thing called the human race. Jesus does not care what you may have done in the past. He still seeks you. Jesus does not care what you are involved in today. He will not flat out reject you, but he will seek you as Savior. Salvation is open to all. 
The Bible, of course, never speaks of race directly. You cannot find it. I, couldn't, I have not found it. If you find it, let me know. Tell me your version first. <clears throat> uh, it speaks, when it speaks of the peoples of the world, it speaks of kindreds and tongues and peoples and nations. It doesn't mention the color of the skin. It never refers to skin color. We teach our little children uh, red and yellow, black and white. They are precious in his sight. Jesus loves the little children of the world. <coughs> That's our doing. He doesn't even recognize that. <coughs> Another thing we want to see as we go through this is <clears throat> the progression of the understanding of this woman as she interacts with Jesus. She first recognizes that he's a Jew. She catches that right off. Later in the conversation, she recognizes him as a prophet. And finally in the conversation, she realizes he is the Christ. <clears throat> Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for this wonderful time we had this morning. We thank you, Lord, for the friends who came today, for the message that we shared today. We thank you, Lord, even for those who didn't come but were asked. And we pray that next time uh, they may uh, acquiesce to the invitation that is given to them. So now as we look into your word, I pray, Lord, that you would be here in power, that you would guide the speaker, that you would steer the hearer, that we would all be blessed through your word. For it's in Jesus' name that I pray. Amen. <clears throat> So we'll start out. It doesn't matter who you are. If we look in chapter 4 uh, of uh, John, we look in verse 9. Uh, then saith the woman of Samaria unto him, How is it that thou, being a Jew, here's where she recognizes him to be a Jew, ask me to drink, which am a woman of Samaria? For the Jews have no dealings with the Samaritans. <clears throat> Now, in the way of a background, the Jews discriminated against Samaritans. Why? Well, back around 700, a little farther back than 700 BC, Assyria defeated the northern kingdom of Israel, which was called Israel at the time. And what was their practice? But to deport most of the people of the land they conquered and spread them around in their empire. Then they would bring people from other parts of the empire and bring them into the land they had just conquered. And as a result, those, those different peoples intermarried. And so the Jews from Judea, the southern kingdom, who were not involved in this transfer of people, they viewed these people as unclean half-breeds. You're not fully Jewish, and I am. So they, uh, the Jews saw themselves in this day as, of course, God's chosen people. <clears throat> After all, they were given the law and the prophets. They were given the patriarchs and the promises of God. But they chose to hold on to these blessings as their own, not to be shared. Now, in Christianity, we send out missionaries. I don't know of too many Jewish missionaries. And I'm not sl slamming the Jewish community today. It's simply uh, back, especially in this day, that was just not part of, of their religious play with the world, interaction with the world. <clears throat> if someone wanted to join them, there's a procedure to do that. But interestingly, in Scripture... God uses, over and over, these non-Jewish people, like Samaritans, the Zidonians, Gentiles. Multiple times, he uses these to display his love for all. We might remember <clears throat> with Elijah, when he was uh, uh, told to leave where he was hiding in the south of Israel, he was told to go up to this Zidonian woman, this widow, and uh, 
we, we know, of course, of Jesus' parable of the Good Samaritan. You know, we say that in today's world. Well, he's a Good Samaritan. And a lot of people say that. They don't even know what they're talking about. They don't realize it's biblical. And why was that more profound when Jesus talked about the Samaritan who helped the man that was hurt on that road when the priests and the others just walked by him? It's because of the hatred the Jews had for the Samaritans. It made it more poignant. It was more impact. We remember the, the Roman centurion Cornelius who had a vision and asked Peter to come up and visit his home. And amazingly, Peter walked into his home after he was told to do that through a vision. Jews didn't walk into Gentiles' homes. My goodness, Pilate even had to come out to them. They wouldn't walk in. And we know that uh, after the gospel was presented to Cornelius the centurion and his family, they came to faith. And they experienced the reception of the Holy Spirit. And Peter was amazed. These people, that's amazing. We know of Jesus' great commission, go into all the world, and preach and teach and baptize. We remember Paul's call to ministry. When God told uh, one of the, his disciples, Ananias, he said, you go over to Paul, and, and I, I, know, I know Paul's been really trying to hurt the Christian church, but I want you to go over to him. He's blind, and, and you're going to go over, and you're going to speak to him, and I'll restore his sight. And the Lord, and Ananias pushed back, and he said, I know who this guy is. I don't want to do that. And the Lord responded, but the Lord said to him, go thy way, for he's a chosen vessel unto me to bear my name before Gentiles, kings, and the children of Israel. Jesus is the Savior to all. Now the woman was astounded when, when uh, uh, Jesus sat there and talked to her. First of all, Jews did not travel through Samaria. They would literally go eastward to the Jordan River, go up the Jordan River, and then come back to Galilee. So they didn't have to step their foot in Samaria. So she was astounded when this Jew was sitting at the well. Any good Jew would never speak to a Samaritan. Especially a Samaritan woman, let alone ask him, ask her for water that came from her hand. Unclean. She couldn't believe her ears. He spoke to her and he wanted something that she touched. You see, it does not matter who you are. Jesus is an equal opportunity savior. It doesn't matter about past sins. Some will say, well, I've done so much, God would never have me. There's evidence of her past sinfulness in verse, f verse 6. <clears throat> well, we read, now Jacob's well was there. Jesus, therefore, being wearied with his journey, sat thus on the well, and it was about the sixth hour. Well, what, what does that say? Well, women normally would come to the well and draw the water in the cool of the morning and the evening. This woman appeared alone at noontime. The sixth hour is noontime. So she may well even have been an outcast from her own society. They didn't want anything to do with her, and she didn't want anything to do with them. She came alone in the heat of the day to draw water at the well. Certainly, she must have been lonely and downtrodden, perhaps seeing herself as worthless. So, what had she done? Why would she do this? Well, we see that in verses 16 and 17 in chapter 4. Jesus saith unto her, Go, call thy husband, knowing full well the whole situation. 
and come hither. The woman answered and said, I have no husband. Jesus said unto her, Thou hast well said, I have no husband, for thou hast had five husbands. Oh, past sin. Was this five husbands, perhaps because of adultery? Maybe she was just impossible to live with. Certainly not a keeper. She had a sordid past. Married five times. She seemed to be an outcast throughout her life. Because this, this took time. Five marriages and broken marriages. She had this lifestyle throughout her time. But Jesus is an equal opportunity savior. He still talked with her. It doesn't matter about your present sins. In verse 18, the second half of the verse we read, Jesus continued saying to her, and he whom thou now hast is not thy husband. And that saidst thou truly. Oh, so she's now living a life of compromise. She's living in an unmarried relationship. Perhaps it's out of desperation. She's living with this man just to have a home. She's probably unwanted and desperate, certainly alone. You see, this type of lifestyle, she's suffering sin's consequences. She was probably without hope in a hopeless situation living unmarried, discarded by society, simply existing day to day. You know, there are a lot of people in our society today that are not, not unlike this woman. They have lived without God their entire life. They have lived by their own rules. They uh, in, in indeed invite others to live by their rules, which leads to consequences, serious consequences. We see the broken families in our society. Uh, marriage uh, is, is no longer a contract with God between two people and God. It's just an agreement between two people. And when one gets fed up with it, they get rid of it. And the kids pay the price. There's, there's no spiritual understanding in our society my wife just started a, a Bible, after school Bible club at one, one of the local uh, elementary schools and the kids know nothing, nothing. This is our society today. It's where we are. And they have nowhere to, re to turn. Things get hard and some of it's self-inflicted because of the lifestyle they choose. Things get hard and they have nowhere to go. Marriage, quite often, is no longer even viewed as necessary. Well, I'll live with them for a while, and if it works out, maybe we'll get married. We see the violence in our society when people are frustrated. They have nothing, no way to vent, no way to understand. They have no purpose. They have no worth. We see teenagers swarming downtown Chicago, destroying everything in their sight, attacking people in stores cars. We see the shootings. These people who have been hurt, perhaps by decisions they made, perhaps by others outside. And what's the only recourse they have? They have no God. They have no support. They grab, they grab an automatic weapon and go in and kill as many as they can before they're killed. It's called suicide by police. How empty is that? How often have we seen that in the last three or four months in our society? We see suicide among young people. They're hopeless and hapless. And without God, they're living in a sinful society, perhaps in a sinful family, and in sin themselves. And Jesus pointed to this woman and said, surely the man you're with is not your husband. And the woman's response to that in verse 19 is, The woman say, saith unto him, Sir, I pre perceive that thou art a prophet. Now he's been elevated from a Jew to a prophet. Because he's telling her things he's not supposed to know. Ah, oh, there's another 
symptom of society, of man, of people. We carry things around and keep them to ourselves. We don't, we're ashamed to let others know. She perceived that he was a holy man. She was intrigued, though, not fearing. He spoke to her regardless of her present sins. Jesus is an equal opportunity. Savior. Now, Jesus' reaction, proactive reaction to this whole thing, we see in verse, uh, verses uh, 21 through 24. And we read, Jesus said unto her, Woman... Believe me, the hour cometh, he's speaking future here, when ye shall neither in this mountain nor yet at Jerusalem worship the Father. She was talking about where they worship and where the Jews worship. And this was his response. Ye worship, ye know not what. We know what we worship, for salvation is of the Jews. But the hour cometh, here's those words again, future tense, and now is when the true worshipers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father seeketh such as uh, such to worship him. God is spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and truth. So regardless of who this woman was, what she had done in the past, what she was involved in at the time, what was his response? What wasn't his response? Is there any condemnation in that? There is none. And after all, he was God incarnate speaking to this lowly Samaritan woman. He was talking with an unclean serial sinner. A woman, no less. And he began to witness and teach her not condemn and point fingers at her. He was showing his mercy and his love for the lost. In verse 21 that we just read, he was prophesying of the future, what would happen. And in verse uh, 22, he was teaching her some truths about the, the spiritual nature of faith in him. And in verses... Uh, 23 and 24, he was actually witnessing to her. Then we come to uh, one of the amazing things in, in Scripture. There are a couple, uh, there are, we have a number of well-known verses that we have memorized, and someone starts, we can finish them, and all that. But there, there are two that stand out to me, and one of them is what we're going to look at now, Jesus' confession, in verses 25 and 26. The woman saith unto him, I know that Messiah cometh, which is called Christ. When he is come, he will tell us all things. And here it is. And Jesus said unto her, I that speak unto thee am he. He had never said this before. He told the Samaritan woman at the well, this outcast woman, who he was in absolutely clear claim clean and clear language. Many times when people would ask, he would answer, but it would be hedged, it would be cloaked. Here he said, I am he, I am the Christ. Now when she, she asked the question or talk, spoke about the Messiah, she said, <clears throat> we see, she mentioned Messiah and Christ and uh, indeed Messiah. They both mean anointed one, Messiah is from the Hebrew Mashiach, and it's translated in English Messiah. And of course, the Greek Christos is translated Christ. They mean the same, the anointed one. And in verse 26, Jesus openly and clearly declared that he was the Messiah to the Samaritan woman at the well at noontime. Jesus never directly, clearly declared himself the Messiah until his illegal trial before the crucifixion. <clears throat> he only did it in this forbidden place and only to this a Samaritan woman who was living in sin. Jesus is an equal opportunity, Savior. 
Now the woman's reaction, we read in verses 28 and 9, Then the woman left her water pot and went away into the city and saith to the men, Come, see a man which told me all things that I ever did. Is not this the Christ? Now he has been elevated to the Christ, having told her that. Now she was a witness. Intertwined in this during the conversation between Jesus and the Samaritan woman, Jesus used a metaphor of water, which fit the situation. Where were they sitting? Next to a well. And in verses 13 to 15, we read, Jesus answered and said unto her, Whosoever drinketh of this water shall thirst again. But whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst. But the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of water springing up into everlasting life. And the woman saith unto him, Sir, give me this water that I thirst not, neither come hither to draw. She still didn't fully understand it. She saw him as talking about the water in the well, not the spiritual water in the well of salvation. She was speaking in practical terms. He was speaking in spiritual terms. Now we see these, this metaphor of water in the Old Testament. In Isaiah, in, uh, Isaiah 12, we, we read, Therefore with joy shall ye draw water out of the wells of salvation. This wasn't a new Metaphor in Isaiah 44, for I will pour water upon him that is thirsty and floods upon the dry ground. And I will pour my spirit upon thy seed and my blessing upon thine offspring. He's speaking of pouring out the water of salvation of the spirit coming forth. Now, a few ch chapters later in John, <clears throat> Jesus used, again, the same analogy, and it's further explained in John 7. We read, in the last day, said Jesus, the great, oh no, excuse me, in the last day, the great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried, saying, if any man thirst, let him come to me and drink. He that believeth on me, as the scripture has said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. And then parenthetically, he says, But this spake he of the Spirit, which they that believe on him should receive. For the Holy Ghost was not yet given, because that Jesus was not yet glorified. Here's a little explanation of this metaphor of the water. <clears throat> so he was explaining to her salvation through faith, using the metaphor of the water. And we know the call of God, as we have just discussed, is to all people. One of those verses that we all know, for God so loved the world. It doesn't say Caucasians, it doesn't say the Jews, it doesn't say any ethnicity. He so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, and whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God sent his son into the world, uh, not sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. You ever hear the word world in there a couple times? For all to be saved. His motive was love for the world, for all peoples. And of course the method Christ used would take, was to take sinners penalty upon himself. It's called the substitutionary atonement. And his mission was to offer the free gift of salvation. Now to the Christian, it's our commission. In Matthew 28, go, thee for, there, go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe whatsoever things I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. You note all nations. There's no specificity in it. 
Jesus is an equal opportunity Savior. And to the unbeliever, well, in verse 14 in our chapter 4, he says, But whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst, but the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of water springing up into everlasting life. The promise of salvation by faith. How do I drink the water of Jesus well? Well, by faith we ask for the water of life. It's called salvation. Regardless of our race, our ethnicity, regardless of our past, regardless of our present, we simply come before him and confess our sins. We confess our belief that Jesus died, was buried, and rose again, paying our sin debt, and promising us everlasting life. And we call on God to receive. In verse 10, in this conversation, Jesus answered and said to her, If thou knewest the gift of God, and who it is that saith to thee, Give me to drink, thou wouldest have asked of him. He would have given thee living water. It's a gift that's given. It's not a salvation that's earned. Who can earn it? No one. Jesus has never turned anyone away. Anyone who calls upon Christ, regardless of who they are, what they have done, what they're mixed in, up in at the time, even as this Samaritan woman, if they believe and ask, he will respond. His disciples then returned. And in verse 27, we read, And upon this came, upon this came his disciples and marveled that he talked with the woman. Yet no man said, What seekest thou, or why talkest thou with her? Good Jews didn't do that, but our Savior would. Jesus is an equal opportunity Savior. Let's pray. Dear Lord, as I scan the people that are in front of me, I see uh, the saints of God. And I know that each of us has our story in that time when we realized, even as this woman at the well, our, our sinfulness and the escape made possible through uh, faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. And that day that we called upon you to receive him. And Lord, we thank you that regardless of our situation at the time, you loved and you called. You patiently answered. You did not condemn. And Lord, you saved. We thank you for the love you, you display. We pray, Lord, for strength that we can react in the same way that your son did with this woman at the well. For certainly he is an equal opportunity savior. In Jesus' name I pray with thanksgiving. Amen.